Hello and welcome to chapter 15, Freshwater Systems and Resources. Basically, by the end of this chapter video, you're going to want to have a good understanding of everything and anything that has to do with freshwater systems. That includes groundwater, aquifers, and even how we clean our sewage water. Okay, first let's take a look at freshwater systems. Surface water. So surface water basically is what it sounds like. It's the water on the surface of our planet. And that only accounts for actually 1% of all of the Earth's fresh water. Now the term watershed is something you're going to want to know for apes. Watershed is basically the area of land drained by our river system. Now let's take a quick look at this uh, lake diagram here. So this is the different levels of a lake. And this doesn't seem very important, but I have uh, been given FRQs on practice AP exams that do go over the different levels of the lake. So it's just something to keep in uh, the back of your mind, maybe. Okay, so let's just run through it quickly. So basically, in lakes and ponds, emergent plants grow along the shoreline in the littoral zone up here. The limnetic zone is the layer of open sunlit water where photosynthesis takes place. Sunlight does not reach the deeper profundal zone, which is down here, and the benthic zone at the bottom of the water is often muddy and rich in nutrients and low in oxygen. Okay, now let's uh, go over the key term wetlands. So a wetland is something uh, actually very, very important to environmental science. So basically what a wetland is, is uh, an area that has soil that's very saturated with basically a shallow pool of standing water and a lot of vegetation. So basically what a wetland does and why it's beneficial is it slows runoff, it reduces flooding, it recharges aquifers, and it even flanters pollutants, which we'll get into a little later in this chapter. Okay, now let's talk about groundwater quickly. So groundwater accounts for about a fifth of the Earth's fresh water. Groundwater is held in aquifers, which is a word you should also know. And an aquifer is basically, think of that as a spongy rock under the Earth's surface. And that's where we keep a lot of the uh, groundwater. And so within an aquifer, uh, there is a, something known as a water table. So in between two layers of aquifer, there's something known as the water table. And then even within more specific types of aquifers, we have the two types. There's a confined aquifer and an unconfined aquifer. Basically, they are what they sound like. So a confined aquifer is confined, and it's harder to recharge. Uh, comparatively, an unconfined aquifer is an easy to recharge, but it is easier to uh, replenish with water. And there's something known as fracking, which is actually big environmental news uh, on the national level at this point, uh, which we'll get into a little later in the book, but the problem with fracking is that it, it uh, pollutes these two types of aquifers. Okay, let's take a look at water uses. So first of all, there is something known as consumptive use, which is basically what it sounds like. Consumptive use is basically when you remove and do not return water to an aquifer. And the biggest uh, consumptive use would be irrigation here. So irrigation, we've discussed before, it's basically the largest consumptive use of water from aquifers uh, and it's just watering plants, so think about watering big farms. Okay, so if there's consumptive use, there's also, on the flip side, non-consumptive use. So again, that's basically what it sounds like. That's when somebody would temporarily remove water from an aquifer and then eventually uh, put that water back, so it's not ever actually used and depleted. This brings us into dams and reservoirs, which we're going to discuss in our next slide here. Okay, so now let's take a look at dams, reservoirs, and depletion. So we should all be familiar with what a dam is. Think of something like the Hoover Dam. So it basically blocks the flow of a stream or a river. And when this happens, this creates a reservoir. And a reservoir is basically an artificial lake that uh, it stores water for human use. So uh, at the moment, dams are pretty controversial because many activists are pledging to get them removed because they say that they hurt the river ecosystem, which is true. So right now, a lot of people are trying to get dams removed so that the original uh, stream and river ecosystems could come back to how they were. Okay, now let's talk about wetland loss and the Ramsar Conference. So as we discussed, uh, wetlands are imperative. They're very, very important. And so a lot of people for a lot of years were uh, getting rid of wetlands in order to develop space because they didn't appreciate how important wetlands truly are. Uh, but wetlands really are important, and people understand this now, and so there is something known as the Ramsar Conference, which they basically uh, pledge to preserve uh, wetland ecosystems, which is always good. Okay, now let's take a look at depleting groundwater. So basically, uh, a lack of water could lead to future wars, and that's a problem. Because there are so many people living on this world and the population keeps growing, we're pretty much running out of water as we like, deplete uh, confined aquifers and things that are harder to recharge. And so a point of contention in the future could be because there are so many people coming onto this world, 
that future wars could be fought over water, which is kind of a scary thought. This brings us into the idea of bottled water, the arch nemesis of environmental science. So bottled water is kind of dumb in the regards that uh, it hasn't been proven to be any cleaner or healthier than tap water. But a lot of people in developed countries such as the United States or Great Britain or France are drinking bottled water regularly, which is just extremely wasteful and unnecessary. It's uh, bringing all this plastic into the world, which, as we all know, doesn't biodegrade very easily, and it's very wasteful and unnecessary. So we need to be able to cut back on that bottled water usage. Okay, this brings us into water pollution sources and forms. So there are two main water pollution sources we're going to talk about today, and they're very general terms, the first of which is point source pollution. So think of this factory here. So point source pollution basically comes from a direct location that you can pinpoint. So say a factory putting a smoke tower on top and releasing smoke. You can point and say that factory is releasing this amount of certain emissions. That's point source. Non-point source pollution is something a little trickier. That's basically the cumulative uh, multi-source imports of certain uh, pollutants. So think of like a city street. There are cars polluting, there are people dropping trash. There are a whole bunch of things all working together and it's hard to pinpoint what's polluting what exactly. That's the difference between the two. Okay, so now let's quickly look at pollution forms. So the book does uh, a bunch of little paragraphs on each of these. So we're not gonna go over all of them because a lot of it is review, but the book gives little paragraphs. So if you want uh, a little more help, go back in the book and read those because those are actually very well written. Okay, so uh, there are a bunch of forms that pollution could come in uh, when referring to groundwater and water pollution. So there are toxic chemicals, sediment, thermal pollution, nutrient pollution, and pathogens and waterborne diseases. Now let's take a look at groundwater pollution and regulation. So the main problem that we face with groundwater pollution today is the leaching of chemicals from pollutants. So think about like a factory polluting and that those chemicals from those pollutants sinking into our underground aquifers. The problem with that is once an aquifer is polluted, it's very, very hard to reverse that damage. It's much easier to prevent those aquifers from getting polluted than to reverse the damage already done. So that's when acts such as the Clean Water Act were passed in the 70s. And basically what that does is it makes it illegal to dump point source pollution without a permit. So again, this is one of those environmental legislations that gives people responsibility. And so it's easier to point the finger, thus people are uh, less likely to pollute. Okay, so this now brings us into wastewater treatment. So currently in the uh, United States and most developed countries, there are these two main primary and secondary treatments. And then there's this pretty much optional uh, future uh, tertiary treatment, which we're going to get into a little later. So let's start with primary treatment. So primary treatment is when the uh, influent comes in. And so that's the, uh, the raw sewage comes into the plant. And so basically that's when the physical removal of solids occurs. So gravity does its work. Uh, about 60% of all the gross stuff is taken out of that sewage. And uh, it is then moved to the secondary treatment tanks, which are full of bacteria. And so basically what those bacteria are going to do is they're going to eat all of the remaining, or at least like 98% of the remaining gross stuff from that uh, sewage water. So then from there, most of the time, this is the water that we're using. However, there's something known as tertiary treatment, which uh, currently is very, very expensive and so not used that commonly. But this could be the future. This could be the difference between us actually reusing our sewage water, which sounds really gross, but tertiary treatment gets the water so clean that you wouldn't actually know you're drinking recycled sewage water. So let's just get into the logistics of how this works. Basically, you run the effluent, or the effluent, uh, which is what comes out of this secondary treatment here, through a wetland system. And so as I discussed before, wetlands are incredibly important. Basically, they have the ability to uh, filter pollutants, and so they could filter out all of the remaining bad stuff, and uh, that water is unbelievably clean after tertiary treatment. So that could be the future of how we uh, conserve water. Okay, so this brings us to our conclusion. So basically, water is a finite and valuable resource. We all know this. However, pollution and growing population threaten our water supply. So basically, we need to practice sustainability, and we need to figure out how to keep our water supply from diminishing. Okay, uh, next time in chapter 16, we're going to take a look at marine and coastal systems and resources. Thank you and see you next time.